So welcome everyone. Uh, today we have Professor Ivo Białoniński Pirula, so one of the founder or practically the founder of our institute, uh, who has been long-standing director, supervisor of many physicists who are now professors also. So for his achievement, uh, mostly in the field of the quantum electron dynamics, he was awarded uh, a number of prizes, including uh, the most prestigious prize in Poland, which is the award of the Foundation of Polish Science. Uh, last month, he received the Marian Smoluchowski Medal from, Polish physical, from the Polish Physical Society. And today he will tell us about phenomenon of backflow. So, Professor, please. Welcome, everybody. I hope that I will explain what this backflow is all about. Uh, it is simpler than presented in some publications. So let me begin now. This is work in progress. Uh, one of the collaborators is a young gifted student who came to our center for what is called Praktika Studentska. And we began this work with him, but I will just give you an a simple summary of what it is all about. When you search in the internet, what is backflow? You get two pages of backflow, which are some sophisticated fireplaces called kominki zapachowe. And then on the third page, you may find something about backflow in physics. And my interest in backflow started when Radek Wapkiewicz met when we discussed some problems in quantum optics and he mentioned this phenomenon. And I, then I searched the literature and the results I will present shortly here. So backflow is quite old. It was found in non-relativistic quantum mechanics. 30 years ago, and it was called intriguing quantum mechanical phenomenon, clearly non-classical effect, peculiar quantum effect, and many other similar statements. Many papers even use in the title, the term quantum backflow. Yeah. And in this talk, I will show that backflow, although it appears in quantum context, is a property of waves. And of since course. quantum mechanics can only be defined as wave mechanics, no wonder that we find backflow in it. Wow. This seminar has two purposes. One is to explain backflow, but on the other hand, I want to show you that the spinorial formalism, which is not widely known in the community of physicists, may be very helpful in doing concrete special calculations. Spinners were introduced into physics, as you know, by Pauli, but they were introduced in different forms. You would be surprised when you look into some works of Euler, he really had spinners under some <laughs> cover of mathematics. So in this seminar, I use a very pedestrian approach to spinners. You don't have to know anything very profound. Spinners in this talk are just two dimensional. <laughs> Something is, oh, I see. I heard some comments. Spinners in my talk are just two dimensional complex objects, two complex numbers, which transform as follows, under all rotations and Lorentz transformation. The simple transformation under rotation was used in practice, even in very peculiar applications. For example, in one of the books in Russian that I have, it was mentioned that spinners were used to control the rotation of rockets 
the calculation with spinners is much simpler than the three-dimensional calculations with Euler angles. And nothing you have to know except that the determinant of this matrix two by two matrix SAB is one. In addition to these basic spinners, I will consider also complex conjugate spinners denoted by phi A dot. This dot was introduced by Roger Penrose, and I like this notation. Even before Roger Penrose, actually, that was not quite like that. Corson introduced dots, but when Penrose started working on it, somehow his printers could not print dots over letters, so they replaced dots by slashes. Okay, anyhow, we have these spinners. From spinners, we can form more complicated objects. And there is one more thing that you should know to understand the rest of my talk. There is something like the metric tensor in the spinorial calculus. It's anti-symmetric matrix, epsilon AB. So it does not look like a metric tensor because it's not positive definite, but it plays similar role in the following sense. The matrix epsilon AB is invariant under SAB transformations because it is just multiplied by the determinant and the determinant is restricted to the value of one. Therefore, since this is an invariant spinner, the concept of raising and lowering the spinner indices with epsilon works. And now an important role is formed by four invariant spin tensors. These are mixed objects. They have the spinorial indices, one dotted, one undotted and the normal four dimensional vector index. What are the properties of these spin tensors? They are invariant under the simultaneous transformation of the mu index and A and B indices. They are quite simple and they are related to what else could it be but to Pauli matrices. Mm -hmm. G0 is just the unit matrix and the remaining Spatial components are the famous Pauli matrices. From these products, we can build another spin tensor, et cetera, et cetera. And this is all you should know to understand what this is all about. So let me go back and to this paper that appeared 30 years ago. The authors, Bracken and Mello, considered a wave function in one dimensional wave mechanics. And they started from the Fourier transform of this wave function. And the Fourier transform contained only positive values of momentum or the wave vector, if you wish. And then they calculated the probability current in position space. And they found to their surprise that in some regions of position space, there was this backflow. The current was moving in the opposite direction, even though all momenta were in the positive direction. And later there are many papers, they more confirmed this in many different models. And now I will do something which I like, that namely I will study the Maxwell electrodynamics to see whether there is any backflow in Maxwell electrodynamics. Classical electrodynamics, no Planck's constant, just normal Maxwell equation. Now, how do we define backflow in this context? Well, the backflow will be related first to the Fourier transform, which is quite simple because Maxwell equations are linear. And then this will be connected with some flow in coordinate space. So I will phrase this in the spinoral language and you will see how useful is this language in terms of spinners. I will consider a symmetric spinner. Symmetric spinner 
has two indices, but since it is symmetric, there are only three independent components. These are complex numbers. Therefore, this object carries the same information as the electromagnetic field described by E and B, because they also have six components altogether. And now, big surprise that was known to various people in the past, and Roger Penrose, whom I mentioned, made big use of that. Maxwell equations can be written in this form here, very simple form, using this mixed object, which is like the metric of some kind, first order derivative, of course, because Maxwell equations are first order differential equations. And this simple set of equations, notice that there are four equations here. A takes on two values and C takes on two values. So we have two by two equals four, four complex equations. This is the same as eight real equations. And we have really eight Maxwell equations because in addition to the equations that contain time derivative, we also have the divergence requirements. Now, this is the assignment. This is the relation between spinners and the components of the electromagnetic field. They're, of course, containing complex unit i, because phi are complex numbers. And when you make the substitute, the equations which I mentioned here become ordinary, well-known Maxwell equations. Now, why is phi AB better than E and B? Because there is a very simple discovery that was made by Roger Penrose again. Namely, he found that the solutions of all wave equations of this form, so they look like the Maxwell equation, which I mentioned before, except that they have many more indices. Phi A1, A N, A N, are just spinners with many indices. They are symmetric in all the indices. And now the construction that Penrose disco discovered is the following. Suppose you have a solution of wave equation, ordinary wave equation, one dimensional complex solution of the wave equation. And then you consider the formula in which there are derivatives of the solution which are multiplied by this famous mixed tensor and some fixed spinner. And for our calculations, we use the simplest possible choice. Sigma A is one zero. If you choose a different sigma, you get a different solution. And also when you get different chi, you have a different solution. And this formula fits very well our task because it is much easier to deal with the solution of one dimensional wave equation than to deal with all Maxwell equations at the same time. Since we are supposed to restrict in the Fourier transform the values of the wave vector only to positive values of kz, k in the z direction, it is much easier to do it in the Fourier transform for this cut. So next we will just evaluate the derivatives. So what is the basic solution which I choose? This is my beloved solution. It's called Hopfion because it's related to Hopf vibration. And it was studied by many people. I think that now the number of papers on Hopfion is over hundred, if not more. So this is a copy of one of the papers, which shows how intricate are the electric and magnetic field lines for this solution. I will exhibit this solution in detail in one moment. I just wanted to explain the term option, and this is directly related to hop vibration. By the way, which I mentioned when I 
had a talk some years ago on Hopfion that Hobbes discovered this in what is now Poland, in Przesieka. In, in those days, when one sent a paper for publication, one often at the end wrote the name of the place where this idea was developed. And in this case, it was the German name of Przesieka near Brussels. So now we go to this solution. This is Hopfian solution. When you look at this Hopfian solution in position space, you see that it almost looks like the relativistic distance, except that the time variable shifted by an imaginary unit, by imaginary parameter A. So therefore this solution is regular. If A is zero, that would be singular on the light cone. However, when A is different from zero, it is not. And the Fourier transformation is very simple. It's just the exponential of the modulus of the wave vector. Now it takes some exercise in mathematical physics to calculate this integral. I had to use some complicated formulas from Grafstein and Rizik, but the result is quite simple. It is a result that does not contain any special functions, just the product of two square roots. Of course, this solution, since I restricted the Z component, is spherically, it's, oh, sorry, it's cylindrically symmetric because it depends on x squared by y squared. Now, the only thing to do is to differentiate this relatively simple function. However, when you do the first derivative, it's quite simple, then the second is more complicated. And what we need is not just the spinner, but we need the pointing vector. Why pointing vector? Because pointing vector defines the flow the flow of energy. And the flow of energy is the property which is similar to the probability current that was studied in all previous calculations of the backflow. So here is the formula. It's a simple exercise. You have to substitute the relations that I mentioned before. And when you evaluate these products of spinners and its complex conjugates, you show that this is the ordinary pointing vector E cross H. By the way, I sometimes cannot refuse the temptation to mention that when you do Maxwell electrodynamics according to Maxwell, you can do a lot without, without the introduction of material constant. And then the flow of energy is E cross B. And the question is, what is D cross, I'm sorry, E cross H. So the question is, what is D cross B? D cross B is not the pointing vector, but it is the density of the momentum of the electromagnetic field. Anyhow, now we apply the Penrose formula. We differentiate twice these components, which we need here, including the third component, which is not mentioned here, but it should have been. It's my mistake. And this is the result. The result is the Z component, which is plotted here as a function of Z and rho. I mentioned before that we can have cylindrical symmetry here. And indeed, the Z component is cylindrically symmetric. It's not true about the X and Y components of the pointing vector. But the Z component happens to be cylindrically symmetric. So we can plot it as a function of rho and Z. And you clearly see the scale here 
on the vertical axis is completely arbitrary because we have, we can have any intensity of the electromagnetic field. We can multiply it by a complex constant. The solution of, of these spinners, and of course, this will not change the equations. So I have chosen the scale in such a way that it clearly shows what is it all about. We see that the Z component of the pointing vector has negative values in some region of space. This is calculated for a fixed value of T and fixed value of this parameter A, which fixes the scale somehow. Now I go next to a very simple case, even simpler than Maxwell equation. There is something called Weyl equation. In my family of spinorial equations, this is the simplest equation. It described neutrinos before it turned out that neutrinos are not really massless. They're almost massless, but not quite. And the flow that we can find in the solutions of Weyl equation now are very similar to the flow that was discovered in non-relativistic wave mechanics, except that now it's a relativistic theory. So in addition to the spatial components of the current, we also have the time component, which is the probability density. And the current is the probability current. Now the calculations are much simpler because only the first derivative is needed. And when we do these calculations, and the result is the following, the Z component of the current, again, in the region, which is similar, by the way, to the region. Uh, by the way, uh, I write these I mark this axis with dimensionless variables because there is this dimensional parameter A that appeared at the very beginning that fixed the scale. So everything here is measured in units of this parameter. That is why here we only see dimensionless units. And by the way, the region in rho and z is similar to what we saw in the Maxwell theory. So this is all I wanted to say. I don't want to burden you with many details. The phenomenon of back flow is not a quantum effect. It is found in the solutions of various wave equations. And I'm sure if somebody has enough patience can find it in some sound waves, for example, etc. All we need is that the Fourier transform makes sense, therefore the equations must be linear. If for nonlinear equations, perhaps one can somehow generalize it, I don't know how. The only requirements for backflow are the existence of the Fourier representation, so it makes sense to restrict the integration to positive values of Kz, and the existence of some flow vector. By the way, these flow vectors that I considered have one common property. They obey the continuity equation. The energy density in Maxwell theory in the pointing vector obey the continuity equation. And the, the probability density and the probability current also, of course, obey the continuity equation. I will also have an announcement later, which is not related to the topic of my talk, but before that, I would like to hear some questions. Can I make a comment? Yes, or start the questions. Uh, well, the question, yeah, well, I can phrase the comment in the form of a question. Can you just a comment also? <laughs> the, the question is, it's remarkable how that happened that the people working on that backflow for so many years have not dared or care to open a book by Lev Landau on hydrodynamics because they will learn 
what is the rule of a backflow in the hydrodynamics. And let me uh, explain that it has basically nothing to do whether the equations are linear or not. Imagine you have a liquid and you put a particle in it, one of the particles of the liquid. And when, when you move a little bit of that particle, it disturbs the flow. The, it generates a flow of the whole liquid. Mm -hmm. So when it moves that part, that particular atom or a particle moves a little bit, it enters a fluid which is already disturbed by the equations governing the flow of the liquid. And therefore the velocity of the same chosen atom at the time t depends on the velocity of that atom at the time equals zero. And this dependent is given by the property of a liquid, which for example, contains the viscosity coefficient. And whether this perturbation of the, of the liquid is described by the Navier-Stokes equation or other equations is in some sense irrelevant because that can be solved. And then if you multiply the velocity of a particle at time t by the velocity of a particle at time zero, you get a certain expression which depends on viscosity. But if you average that over the Maxwellian distribution function of the velocities of a particles and it take the integral over all time, then this result of that integration is a diffusion coefficient for the liquid. So diffusion coefficient of the liquid depends on the viscosity. And that was already known to Albert Einstein in Ro and uh, also to Smolochowski. And it is called the einstein smolochowski relation between the uh, diffusion coefficient and the viscosity of the liquid. And unfortunately, this integral diverges in less than three dimensions because the correlation function decays not exponentially in the liquid, but decays as a power law. And the exponent of the power law depends on the dimension of the space and it diverges in two than one dimensions and therefore we do not have two dimension liquids. So the phenomenon of a backflow is extremely well known in hydrodynamics. But it's a different, the name is the same, but it's a different phenomenon. Well, it is the same phenomenon. You have the flow of the liquid which goes against. You have I a momentum. I understand, but it has the nothing momentum to do with the field. The yes, all but... the results here is that the momentum of the field at the certain is going backwards. Is a, uh, you start with the momentum going in the one direction, and all of a the sudden there is a flow against it. And okay, this is this, no, I understand, but what I was talking about is the backflow, which requires the existence of the Fourier representation of the function. That's all. Yeah, but I mean, the, the, the same refers to the hydrodynamic equations, they do have the Fourier transform representation. In the linear approximation. No, even in nonlinear, they just are nonlinear equation. There is a nonlinear hydrodynamics written in the form of a Fourier transform, and that's the basis of a turbulence theory, which actually was also known to Heisenberg. No, no, I'm saying that this is a problem that the field disturbed has this effect of a momentum going backwards. And by the way, this phenomenon in hydrodynamics, the, the power law decay of function was discovered first on a computer by Bernie Olber in the 50s by simulation of a neutron flux in atomic explosion. Um, we have raised hand of uh, Nikolai, so maybe we can also go with questions. Uh, thank, you thank you very much. So it's so both a question and remark again. I think a big important important part of, of the fractal phenomenon is that the flux is not a linear, but rather quadratic function of the fields. Because of that, you cannot simply sum uh, the contributions of each of the partial uh, waves you're, you're composing your solution from. And even though each of them gives a positive, uh, has positive flux, 
this does not combine to an overall positive flux. So I think that this quadratic uh, form of, of the flux is here quite important. Yes, it is essential. I agree. And that also is the point that this is not it, this is this phenomenon is not really related to the linear equation. I may add to Mikolai Kozinski that the same phenomenon exists in linear gravity. Hmm. We have a question of uh, Tai Hun Li. Tai, can you proceed? Yeah. Uh, so the you found actually probability current in the Maxwell equation that probability means uh, the probability of a photon or maybe something different. Oh no, this is does the phenomenon that occurs. In, you can forget about all quantum effects. You just have. Maxwell equation, and that's it. And in Maxwell equation, this phenomenon appears. So when we use actually probability current in Maxwell equation, what does that mean? No, I don't think so. So maybe, uh, so Professor Zonjaski, because I see that you unmuted your microphone. No, 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 thanks. Well, to the, to the discussion that we had just a moment ago, I would only add that, of course, in the Maxwell equations, uh, it's not the probability, it's the energy density and, and the momentum distribution, which is, which is discussed. No, no, Am I right? the flow, flow of energy. Sure, sure, sure. sure. Okay, but then I think it shows that this is very general, probably reason. Well, this was a specific example, but from this discussion we had, there might be many different systems. Uh, if there are in, no in more which, questions, which I would like to inject something on my personal note. Mm -hmm. There is a paper in the recent issue of Physical Review A about the position operator for the photon. Mm -hmm. And it's a complicated paper with all kinds of tangent bundles and various sophisticated notions in differential geometry. In my opinion, this paper is just plain wrong from the physical point of view. And if there is someone interested in joining me in writing a comment to Physical Review A, I may reveal that I was the referee of this paper and I rejected it, but the authors were supported by two remaining referees who said that this is a good paper. And when I contacted the editor, the editor said that you can always write a comment. So in a way, I should write this comment, but I am looking for a co-author. And if somebody is interested, I would ask the person first to look at this paper. It's easily available, last issue of this A. In our center, we can access this without a problem. And so I am inviting potential collaborators. You can send me a note if after looking at this paper, you are interested in collaboration. Thank you. Okay, so it was nice. Since we still have some time, perhaps I can, I didn't realize that I will finish it so shortly. I would like to show you something about Hopfian, which I hope will be amusing. Can you see this? No. No. Mm -hmm. It's really amusing. It's a black paint. Oh, I 
don't understand why, because I can see it quite fully. I believe now, you have to stop sharing and share again. Okay. Because it shows only one uh, part of your desktop. Stop share. And where is my share? Share a screen. And aha. Okay, now. Yes. Yes. You see it? Yes. yes. Good. So what do we see here? Hop vibration is a mapping from the points on the surface of the sphere into curves. This mapping, of course, is not one-to-one, -one, but it's a mapping anyway. And when you plot the curves that you get corresponding to various points according to the formula given by Hopf, you see this amazing structure here. Maybe I can enlarge this because some portion is cut off. Oh, still, you cannot see the full picture, but this is the hop vibration in graphical terms. So you can see really that there are very intriguing topological properties of this solution. And of course, hop vibration is not directly related to electromagnetism. It's a mathematical connection, but when you translate this into the electric and magnetic field, you can interpret these lines as the lines of the electric or the magnetic field. Okay, I stop this share. So it looks like a spherical tunnel, this. Mm -hmm. Spherical, atmospheric, electric phenomenon. Uh, yes, I will tell you that there are people now, there is my friend, Spanish friend, uh, Raniada, who wrote a nature paper, who was trying to explain the lightning, the yeah, spherical yeah. lightning, but, well, using the model based on hot vibration. Electric and magnetic field yes, in a complicated they are, way. Yes, they are linked and this looks like, but of course nothing came out of it because the spherical lightning is a solution of magnetohydrodynamic equations and not just Maxwell equations. Of course, equations. of course. May I have one, one comment? Of course, yes. Uh, just a pedagogical comment that, in my opinion, the best, absolutely best introduction to spinors is the one contained in the uh, in this uh, book Gravitation, but by Wheeler Misner Torn, per page one thousand hundred and something. It is very geometric, very simple and active. It contains also those Penrose ideas, but it is very simple and very nice. So this is my first comment. And the other is that, uh, of course, spin one half is simpler than electrodynamics, which is spin one, but spin zero is even simpler. So this backflow, uh, I believe is much, much easier to uh, to demonstrate on just a single scalar equation. And this is just, you just take the uh, superposition of two uh, plane waves going in direction, in positive direction of the axis, say Z, and you immediately see that there are um, regions where the energy flow goes back. And this is just uh, uh, using the, the, the only thing from mathematics you have to know is to analyze second order equation, which is just the, the algebraic it, equation. This is not quite the flow that I 
have in mind because for a scalar solution of the wave equation, the current that you can produce here is already pathological in a certain sense because the current density is not positively definite. And therefore, the arguments that I presented here current are density. somewhat different. Or the, the energy is positive and the, but the energy oh, the energy is positive, that's true. Yeah. But the analog of this would be the current, yes. rather for in this case. And the current does not have the properties. No, the, the energy current, because the energy momentum tensor is yes, yes, yes. It, the energy momentum tensor, yeah, I agree. Yes, I agree. Yes, yes. So so the the uh, the non-diagonal component of the energy momentum tensor is just the uh, energy flow and it perfectly uh, shows this phenomenon the back glow yeah uh, so if i can add uh, another version another comment uh, 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 you mentioned the important role in your calc in your that in your presenting the backflow phenomenon is the continuity equation. Yes. And the continuity equation is relation between some kind of a density and some kind of its current flow. Mm -hmm. of flow. And that is also precisely why this phenomenon happened in hydrodynamics. The, 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 what I'm arguing is that if you have a continuity equation between the densities, which is perturbed yeah. in some sense by the velocity, by the flow, because mm -hmm. that's the, the Maxwell equation or a hydrodynamic equation and the continuity equation, then you are bound to have the backflow. Yes, of course. And this yeah. is what I and mentioned. It's irrelevant whether the equations are linear, nonlinear, or whatever. Yeah, yeah that's true. That's true. It's, it's this of course, of, it's of course another thing that comes to mind is that the group velocity can easily be of a different uh, direction than the yes, phase yeah, velocity. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. yes, yes, of course. That is, right. Yeah, but this this uh, group velocity is different. Mm -hmm. It's the relation of it's a consequence of a continuity equation. Otherwise, you will not be able to to, to fulfill the continuity yeah. equation. Yeah, of course. Of course. So the, may, I, the, may, may I ask an ignorant experimental question, which is related to last comments? We have a waveguide, electromagnetic yeah. metal waveguide, yeah. any yeah. shape, whatever. On yeah. one end, we have a source which generates electromagnetic radiation, which goes into yeah. the waveguide. And I can control the backflow by the boundary condition at the end. If at the end of the waveguide I have perfect termination, I will have dissipation and all energy will be <coughs> converted to heat at the end. On the other hand, if I ha have this continuity of impedance, I can have any backflow. Moreover, as was mentioned now, if I construct my waveguide in a proper way, uh, then I have to use electron beam uh, for uh, as a source of electromagnetic wave for some reason, but I can have just the group velocity and phase velocity in exactly opposite direction. And I can even have interaction of, of, of uh, beam uh, with itself. It's, it's, it's a principle of backward wave oscillator. But, but in that respect, the amount of backflow, at least as far as I can see, depends on the boundary conditions of the transmission line. And in that respect, what you said at the lecture about uh, this condition of existence of Fourier components, does it mean that you have to have a compact support in that respect, a finite uh, some, some size of your transmission line in a certain respect to fulfill that requirement? No, in all my calculations, we dealt with open space. There were no boundary mm -hmm. conditions. These are solutions of Maxwell or Bile equations in free space without any constraints. However, however, if you impose on those um, 
infinite waves, if you impose some uh, um, profile, which is big with respect to the uh, wavelength, nothing changes. Therefore, whether it is infinite or finite, it doesn't change. Except the calculations are much more complicated. Yeah, of course, of course. Do we have more questions or comments? If no, I propose to thank the speaker again. And you can just raise your hands. Thank you.